The next topic in our study of biochemistry is enzymes. So what exactly is an enzyme? What's the purpose of enzymes? And what are some facts that you have to know about enzymes in general? So this is what we're going to discuss in this lecture. So an enzyme is basically a biological molecule with remarkable capabilities. What they do is they catalyze all the different types of biological processes and reactions that take place inside our cells. And without the enzymes catalyzing the reactions, cellular processes would essentially hold to a rate that would make life impossible, at least in the way that we know life today. So the first fact you have to know about enzymes is an enzyme is a biological molecule that catalyzes, speeds up the rate of reactions. Now in our discussion on hemoglobin, we mentioned one important enzyme, namely carbonic anhydrase. And we said that it was carbonic anhydrase that essentially speeds up and allows the conversion of carbon dioxide into its polar form, namely bicarbonate ions. And this is exactly what allows us to actually store the carbon dioxide inside our blood plasma. So carbonic anhydrase essentially hydrates so it combines carbon dioxide with water to produce carbonic acid and carbonic acid being a relatively strong acid will dissociate into these two polar ions hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions now carbonic anhydrase is a very efficient very effective enzyme like most enzymes are in fact this molecule can convert the enzyme can transform 1 million of these carbon dioxide molecules every single second so it increases the rate by 1 million compared to its uncatalyzed form so this enzyme basically helps us transform the nonpolar carbon dioxide that cannot dissolve inside our blood into a form that can be dissolved inside our blood and that's precisely what allows us to effectively and quickly get rid of the carbon dioxide from the cells and eventually expel it by the lungs of our body. Now, fact number two about enzymes. Enzymes typically transform one form of energy into a much more useful form of energy. And one example is the process of photosynthesis, which takes place in plants. So inside plants, we have a variety of different types of enzymes that essentially transform, they harvest or capture the energy that is stored in electromagnetic radiation that comes from the sun, namely light. So they transform the energy that is stored in light into energy stored in the chemical bonds of glucose and sugar molecules. Now, uh, humans and other animals then eat that glucose and they themselves use enzymes in, in the process we're going to discuss eventually. Uh, the process is glycolysis, pyruvate decarboxylation, and then the Krebs cycle. So basically, in these processes, we have many different enzymes that essentially catalyze the transformation of the energy stored in the chemical bonds of glucose into the energy that is stored in the proton gradient that exists across the membrane of mitochondria. And then the energy stored in that membrane in the, in the electrochemical gradient due to the protons found across the mitochondrial membrane, that energy transformed into energy stored in the bonds of ATP molecules, adenosine triphosphates. And we'll discuss that in much more detail eventually. So we see that these enzymes are very, very good at transforming one form of energy that we can't use into a form that we can use. And that is what enzymes do. Number three, enzymes typically do not act alone and they require additional molecules. And these molecules are known as cofactors. So cofactors are helper molecules that are needed for the enzymes to actually function effectively and efficiently. So when an enzyme is not bound to its cofactor, we call the enzyme apoenzyme. But when the cofactor is bound to the apoenzyme, we call that a hollow enzyme. So the hollow enzyme is simply an enzyme bound to its cofactor. Now, we have many, many different types of cofactors as we'll have 
as we'll eventually see. But we can categorize cofactors into two groups, into two categories. We have metal ions and we also have organic, mo organic molecules known as coenzymes that are usually formed from vitamins. Now, one example of a metal ion that acts as a cofactor for carbonic anhydrase is the zinc atom. And we'll talk about that in detail in a future lecture. Now, coenzymes can bind onto proteins either strongly or weakly. And if we have a coenzyme that is bound very tightly to the enzyme, that is known as a prosthetic group. Number four, enzymes are extremely efficient and extremely specific molecules. And what that means is enzymes only bind to specific substrate, specific molecules, and they carry out either a single reaction or a set of reactions that are closely related to one another. So enzymes bind to specific reactants, we also call substrates, and catalyze a single reaction or a set of related reactions and enzymes are highly efficient and limit the number of unwanted products. So for example, in the case of carbonic anhydrase, carbonic anhydrase binds the CO2 and the water, and the CO2 is the substrate. Now, CO2 can react with water in many different ways. For example, in this particular case, we saw that we can produce sugar molecules and oxygen molecules, and these are unwanted products products, at least in this particular case. So what carbonic anhydrase does is it ensures that we form only a single type of product. We do not form any unwanted products in our reaction. So enzymes are highly specific. Another example of a highly specific enzyme that carries out a set of related reactions is trypsin. So trypsin is found in our digestive system. It's a digestive enzyme and what it does is it binds to, poly, uh, to polypeptides, to proteins that we ingest into our body and it basically carries out a set of two closely related reactions. In one of the reactions, it basically cleaves peptide bonds on the carboxyl side of lysine. In the other reaction, it binds and cleaves on the carboxyl side of the arginine amino acid. So this trypsin has a single type of uh, has a single type of substrate, namely the polypeptide, and it carries out two sets, two types of very similar reactions. In one reaction, it cleaves lysine on the carboxyl side. In the other reaction, it cleaves arginine on the carboxyl side. Now, number five, nearly all enzymes are proteins. So, uh, long ago, we essentially thought that all enzymes were proteins, but now we know that some enzymes are actually RNA molecules. So RNA molecules, certain RNA molecules also have the ability to catalyze reactions as we'll see eventually. And the last thing we're going to mention about enzymes is enzymes are not actually used up, are not depleted in chemical reactions. And if enzymes are changed or altered in some way in the reaction, at the end of that reaction, the enzyme will assume its original shape and original structure. So enzymes are not used up and remain unchanged at the end of the reaction. Now, this is not to say that enzymes during the reaction aren't changed in some way. They might be changed, their structure might be changed, but at the end of the reaction, when the enzyme releases the substrate, it assumes its original structure and its original shape. So these are the six facts you have to remember about enzymes. Enzymes greatly increase the rate at which reactions take place. Enzymes typically help transform one form of energy into a much useful form of energy. Three, enzymes do not function alone and they typically do not and they typically need these helper molecules we call cofactors. Number four, enzymes are highly specific. They bind specific substrates and carry out only a single reaction or a set of reactions that are similar as we saw in the case of trypsin. Number five, nearly all enzymes are proteins. Some enzymes are RNA molecules and number six, 
Enzymes are not depleted, they are not changed. At the end of the reaction, they remain exactly the same. 